will be archived for later viewing at our website, uh, uh, screaltors.org slash webinar. And uh, I'll repeat this a couple of times. The Real Estate Commission meeting, uh, Real Estate Commission met yesterday uh, to help us with some issues. We had been receiving complaints from membership on. Uh, the first thing I wanted to let everybody know that 2012 listings, the Real Estate Commission made them retroactive. So you can use the 2012 seller disclosure form. So for listings that are currently active in 2012, you've got a listing now in the, around the state. There's about 47,000 active listings in the different MLSs around the uh, South Carolina systems. All those existing listings, the Real Estate Commission met yesterday and voted to allow it to be retroactive that the seller disclosure form, the current one, the 2012 form, can be used for those listings so listing agents do not have to go out over the holidays and try to track down sellers that may be out on vacation and try to get them to update that form by the January 1. All other listings that begin January 1, 2013, any listings that expire and then are, are renewed uh, after January 2013, you'll use the 2013 seller disclosure form and that's off here to the uh, to my uh, I guess as you're looking at the screen the right side of your screen it's also at the real estate real estate commission website and zip forms is loading that that for uh, for the realtors to put that into our zip forms uh, library This is the most up-to-date form, and you'll see any anyone you'll see at the bottom. I'll say 2013 South Carolina Real Estate Commission, and they use a, a, a D or a delta to denote that. So, big news yesterday: Real Estate Commission met yesterday. 2012 listings. You do not have to update the form uh, by January 1st if you have a 2012 seller disclosure form on your MLS system uh, you can use that the sellers can use that form for buyers uh, even into 2013 any listings beginning January 1st 2013 or following will use the 2013 form so uh, the, we'd like to extend a, a thank you to the real estate commission that uh, met yesterday Yesterday, they scheduled a quick uh, meeting to handle this issue. I'd like to thank uh, Chair Tony Cox, uh, Sarah Takas, Carl Edwards, Manning Biggers, Busey Harley, David Krigler, Wayne Poplin, member at large, and then our public members, Attorney Hamlin O'Kelly and uh, Jonathan Stackhouse, the Commissioners Stackhouse and O'Kelly. They were actually on the uh, uh, started in October 2011. So they worked from the end of 2011 through 2012 to update the form. Form was actually created about 10 years ago, and uh, there's been over the years we've received calls here at the uh, South Carolina Realtors, uh, mainly about uh, adding a repair question and adding a common ownership section. And, and those were added by the Real Estate Commission at their meeting November 28th. So big thanks to the task force of uh, Attorney O'Kelly and Commissioner uh, Stackhouse that got that developed for us. And they were working off some of uh, uh, some past work in 2008. We had a task force that tried to update the seller disclosure at that time, and we had some realtors on there, Peggy Ganey, uh, Janine Keys, Andy Walker, uh, real estate educator Charlie White, at LLR staff and SCR staff worked on that in 2008. 2008, that that draft was not approved by the Real Estate Commission, so in 2011, 
the uh, Columbia Board, uh, their forms committee, uh, Chair Jennifer Harding and President uh, Laura Derrick. I started working with Commissioner Diana Brothers to try to update the form in 2011. Real Estate Commission set up the task force end of 2011. They worked through 2012 and approved the form that we're going to go over today uh, for 2013. And again, if you have a listing, current listing in 2012 with the 2012 seller disclosure form, the Real Estate Commission meet, meeting yesterday ruled that it those are grandfathered. You do not have to use the 2013 seller disclosure form for those listings. Um, and then uh, I want to thank also our forms committee, our 2012 forms committee that also worked with the Real Estate Commission on this draft. Uh, Chair Corwin Millett, uh, Vice Chair Nancy Nelson, uh, past Chair Beth Ross, and other members were Katisha Breland, Dorothy Coriello. Uh, Maxine Dawes, Joanne English, Victor John, Gwen Gray, Betsy Klotz, Carol Pye from Chip Reeves, Adam Rich, Diana Rogers, Bobby Street, Joanne Walkup, and Julie Winston. So this guy, uh, you guys really want to go through the form, so let's get right to it. And I kind of want to give you the filter that we're looking through this form in 2012. The forms committee was looking in the task force, the 2008 task force that we mentioned also met. 2011, the realtors uh, Peggy Ganey, Janine Keyes, and Andy Walker, really looking at it through a lens of a court case. And this is on on the internet, or you can email me, Byron at screaltors.org. I can email you a copy. It's uh, called Chastain versus Hilta Bibble. And it was a seller disclosure case from the Court of Appeal, so it, it sets precedent for all our, our courts in South Carolina, except the Supreme Court. And it was a, a flood issue that involved a prominent brokerage in the upstate. And I kind of wanted to go through the seller. actually said yes there was some water damage the question about is it you know any flood issues with the property it actually answered yes um, and said that there had been some during hurricane Hugo and in you know about uh, 10 years later there was a major tropical storm they had a little bit of flooding buyers bought the property uh, two days later as a heavy You know, or two days of rain rather it resulted in water intrusion on the property causing damage. So they sued the seller and they sued the realtor. And the court had some really good language that helps us a lot. It basically says that realtors do not have a legal duty to investigate legal latent defects in the property or to advise clients on matters outside the scope of your expertise. So you're not a, a contractor or a plumber or electrician, so you've got no duty to advise on those issues. And then went through and came up with some, some extra good language for us. Uh, they reinforce that uh, realtors do not have a duty to inspect or investigate the physical condition of a piece of property for the purpose of confirming or denying statements made by the seller in a seller disclosure. Rather, the legislature places the duty of performing such an inspection or investigation squarely on the shoulders of the buyer. And again, the court again emphasized that to place such a burden on a realtor or other licensees um, investigating conditions of property would require them to have expertise in plumbing, electrical, and construction codes. And the court did not believe that was the intent of the legislature, so they upheld the lower court on that. Um, and then 
The most important language out of this case, it talks about because basically the buyer was saying hey the realtor knew about some of the flooding issues in this neighborhood they lived there they had sold some other properties but the most important language out of this case talks about that even if the realtor knew about flooding in the neighborhood the court case hinges on whether or not the realtor knew or had reasonable cause to suspect the information in the disclosure form was false incomplete or misleading so um, that's a key question that uh, that's driving the uh, a lot of our advice on the uh, the seller disclosure so what you want to do with the seller disclosure it's a legal form. It can create li it's a liability shield for the realtors and the seller if it's written with due diligence and written correctly. Well, because it's legal form under your code of ethics, remember you got to get your 2.5 hours of legal education done by the end of the month. Um, it's a legal form, so you need to advise your sellers to talk to their attorney with questions on it. And I know a lot of realtors say, "Hey, buyer, and a lot of this form is going to make it hard for me to explain this form to my sellers." And you need to realize to keep this liability shield in that court case, you need to treat this form as a legal form and uh, as kind of a hands-off approach. The seller needs to fill this thing out. If the seller has any questions how to fill it out, you need to refer those questions to the seller's attorney because based on that court case language, if you're involved in explaining questions, helping the seller answer, all of a sudden that opens the door. Um, and then we talked about the important language in the court case, uh, it would enable the buyer to say, hey, because the uh, realtor, you know, there's testimony that the real from the seller that the realtor helped me fill this thing out, told me how to answer it. All of a sudden, that that gives the the buyer the proof they need to overcome this case, where it talks about um, that the realtor had a reasonable cause to suspect the information in the disclosure form was false, incomplete, or misleading. So if you're holding that out kind of at, at a distance, letting the uh, seller and their attorney fill it out. It makes it a lot more difficult for a buyer to prove that the realtor had reasonable cause to suspect the information in the disclosure form was false, incomplete, or misleading. So that's kind of the lens that we're working through when our forms committee took the uh, looking at the draft in 2012, when our task force in 2011 with uh, Andy and Janine and Peggy in 2011 and 28, that was kind of the lens they were looking through. Another important thing about this case, you know, to reinforce that Mediation is important for us. This case took about six years. It was a 2003 case, but the ruling wasn't until 2009. So litigation can be lengthy and expensive. So mediation is an alternative to try to get around that. And now we have a court precedent saying that if there's a seller disclosure provided, there's no liability for the realtors involved unless they had reason to suspect the information was um, false, incomplete, or misleading. So let's go through the uh, form. And uh, Mike's got that up here. Uh, section one there it's important to note that in the fourth line down it talks about when you have to do a seller disclosure a seller disclosure has to be completed prior to signing a contract of sale unless otherwise agreed to in the uh, in the contract so a lot of the MLS's require you to put the seller disclosure up and that's your delivery method to potential buyers and remember yesterday the real estate commission met and voted to make it retroactive so if you have 2012 listing you can use the 2012 form that you have on your MLS. You can use that into 2013 without having to scramble and get the buyer to update that seller disclosure. Seller could if they, if they want to update it. But the Real Estate Commission has said that retroactive and uh, Attorney Kel uh, Kelly that was on the uh, commission actually brought up some ex post facto laws that it might even be unconstitutional uh, state or federal constitution to make the 2013 form apply to to current sellers that were operating under the uh, the current law. And if we scroll down, uh, Mike, down to uh, section three, it talks about um, this is direct toward the seller. It says if you're assisted in the sale of the property by a licensed real estate broker or salesperson, you remain solely responsible for completing and delivering the statement to the purchaser. So the seller has a duty to provide this, and if they don't, or if they tell false information. The uh, statute, the statute's uh, South Carolina uh, Code 2750, 
50-65 um, basically talks about if the buyer knowingly violates or fails to perform any duty prescribed by any provision of this article or who discloses any material information on the disclosure statement which he knows to be false, incomplete, or misleading is liable for actual damages approximately caused to the purchaser and court cost. And an important next sentence, the court may award reasonable attorney's fees incurred by the prevailing party. So if a buyer sues, they can actually sue for the, the seller for the damage and they can also ask for statutory attorney's fees which can far exceed the damages. So it's important that the seller knows they need to be truthful and diligent when they fill out the seller disclosure and any questions they should ask uh, their attorney. And then it, in section three as well, it's a, an alert to the seller that even a seller that tries to conceal something, brokers and salespersons have a license duty to disclose any material facts about your product. property that the real estate licensees knows about or reasonably should know regardless of the responses on the statement. So a seller that's trying to conceal something, this is warning them that your real estate agent is not allowed to go along with the concealment and actually has a duty to disclose some of those defects. And then it says you, seller, to complete this form yourself. So that, that's another reminder for real estate agents not to get involved in completing the form for sellers and answer all questions truthfully and as fully as possible. And that's really that court case we talked about. The seller actually said there was some flood damage, but this, the buyer actually said, hey, you didn't go far enough when you explained it. A yes answer requires explanation. And the seller brought up, you know, Hurricane Hugo and a 2002 flooding event. And then, um, you know, as soon as there was a lot of rain, they had some flooding. So basically the buyer was arguing that the seller was less than truthful when they explained that yes answer. And it also has the warning here, please consult with your attorney if you have any questions. And that's directed at the seller. So seller, please consult with your attorney if you have any questions about this legal document that is a while well, it's a liability shield if corrected properly. It's also uh, a representation that you can be sued for and the statute allows for statutory attorney's fees if you're not diligent and truthful when you're, when you're filling it out. And then in number four, Mike's already got that. And it says you must provide the complete statement to the purchaser prior to the time you and the purchaser sign a contract to purchase your property or as the contract otherwise provides. And the South Carolina form, standard forms obviously have that, that section on the uh, seller disclosure. And again, I want to reemphasize, I'll probably say this several times during our webinar. Yesterday, the Real Estate Commission voted that 2012 listings do not have to update the seller disclosure. Um, in that you can use that 2012 seller disclosure form into 2013 for existing listings. Any listing starting January 1st, or say a listing expires, then some, you know, another brokerage or that same brokerage picks it up, then you have to use the 2013 form. Or if you renew the listing agreement, uh, the 2013 form. And this is the language I'm quoting from the Real Estate Commission's message. They emailed that to all licensees that they have email addresses for, so make sure your email addresses are updated with LLR. LLR's phone number 803-896-4400 and it's posted on their website. The easiest way to get to the Real Estate Commission website is just go into your web browser, search for South Carolina Real Estate Commission, it'll be the top uh, Google search. Also on page one, Mike's got that down at the bottom, this box is an addition. This was uh, some complaints from memberships over the years from 2003 to 2013. You know, we need the property address on page one of the form. We actually want the property address on each page. So if the pages get separated, you know, at the office, we can figure out which seller disclosure, put it back together. So we've added the property address, the tax map number, and then just like before, the sellers and buyers initial that page. And uh, if you're using zip forms, this actually will auto load for you. So once you use zip forms, we had some complaints. Hey, it takes a while to fill out all these address boxes. Use your zip forms and it will auto, auto load for you. All right, Mike. Well, uh, Mike's already got it, uh, page two showing up there. And you can see that box has the question that applies to these next um, 13 questions. Yeah, to the next 13 questions, it says in that box there at the top 
As seller of the property identified herein, do you have any knowledge of any problem, malfunction, or defect, or condition characteristic with any of the following? And then we'll go through. And what I'll do is I'll read the questions, and then I'll highlight the, uh, the additions, the changes from the old form to the new form. And our main changes added a major repair question, added a common ownership question, and then we added the addresses at, on each page. So you can see there those boxes. And this is by statute, so the seller has the option to answer yes, no, or no representation. And the no representation answer, um, that's not uh, an ability. The legislature didn't intend that for the seller to be able to use that to conceal issues. So if there's issues, they need to honestly answer. But the no representation would be they actually have no knowledge of any problems. So. But if they have a question about which one of those three to select, um, you need to tell them to ask their attorney. All right. So. Question one is about the foundation, slab, fireplaces, chimneys, floors, windows, including storm doors and screens, doors, ceilings, interior and exterior walls, attached garage, patio, deck, walkways, and other structural components, including any modifications. So that's the same question on the 2003 form all the way up to the 2012. And the 2013 adds a few more issues uh, in A where it asks the uh, basically the siding of the property. Current language has masonry, wood, composition, hardwood, vinyl, synthetic stucco. And added that, you can see they've added stucco, they've added aluminum siding, they've added masonite siding, they've as added cement plank, which is kind of, you know, your classic hardy plank type product. And there's another for that, you know, kind of a catch-all there and they can fill in the blank. Question two, roof and gutters, leakage or other problems. Approximate age of roof covering. That's all, so question two through A is, is the same as the 2003 through 2012 version. 2013 version adds B, are you aware of any leaks during your ownership or within the past three years if your ownership ex three, exceeds three years? In this language limiting the question, the task force uh, did not want sellers that had been there 50 years to have to remember issues, you know, dating back, you know, 20 or 30 years. So during your ownership, or if your ownership is longer than three years within the past three years, were there any leaks? And you would answer that question. Question three remains the same from 2003 through 2013. Water, seepage, leakage, dampness, or standing water, or water intrusion from any source in any area of the structure. Number four remains the same, 2003 through 2013. Electrical systems, outlets, wiring, panels, switches, fuses, circuit breakers, fixtures, etc. Question five remains the same, 2003 through 2013. Plumbing systems, pipes, fixtures, water heater, et cetera. Number six, heating and or air conditioning approximate age. That remains the same, 03 through 13. And to um, A, B, and C, uh, you can see that they've added some other options. In addition to heat source, furnace, heat pump, baseboard, which is current language, has been added solar and then an, an other category for any other type of a heating source. And then for the cooling source, same language, central, wall or window units, added an other option there. And then fuel source, electricity, natural gas, propane, oil, that's standard language from 03 to 12. 13 adds solar and other. And then we've gotten some calls where say there's an upstairs system, a downstairs system, multiple systems. Excuse me. Uh, number six. In 2013, adds this note here. It says, if there are more than one system, please answer the questions again on a separate page. And a lot of the layout, obviously, um, you know, we've had some people saying, hey, the layout could be better and, and it could always be improved. This is a living document the Real Estate Commission is going to be working on going forward. But some of it is space savings, and this is one of the space savings, is to say, hey, if there's another system, then answer on a separate page. And number seven, uh, same, uh, same issues as on the uh, 03 through 12. Um, water supply, water quality, quantity, water pressure. A is the same except we've added other, and B is the same except as other. So A, water supply is county, city, community system, private well, or other. B is water pipes or copper, galvanized, PVC, polybutylene, combination, other. So added other in combination to number seven in 2013. Number eight is basically the same. We've added a few, uh, the task force has added a few additions. One is we've added sewer to the question. Before in 03 through 12, it only asked about the septic system. So in 2013, the word sewer is added at the beginning of question eight. And then again, adding other selections to catch, as kind of catch-alls. So you got type system, septic tank, community system, other, 
Is it connected to county or city system, uh, county systems available? That would be, you know, a lot of properties aren't connected to the city system because they've laid the pipe afterwards, but maybe the pipe's in the front yard and, and for a relatively uh, inexpensive tap-on fee, you could easily connect, get off your, you know, if the septic system ever broke or became uneconomic to use, the option for that buyer would be to connect. Some, there might be a city system or county system way up the road where it'd be very expensive to lay the pipe to get up there and connect, so that's a, a question. And the, the seller would have the best access to the information. They've owned the property, they've gotten those letters from the county or the city about the uh, septic system and uh, the sewer system that's available. And question B, does the system require a sewage lift pump, yes or no? That's an existing question. The word sewage has been added in front of lift pump. And then C is exactly the same from 2003 through 2013. Has the septic system been serviced or pumped during your ownership? Yes or no? And then number nine, appliances, range, oven, attached microwave, hood, fan, dishwasher, disposal are all the same as the 03 through 12 language. Uh, the task force added ice maker. And then also this warning that just because these appliances are listed here, they may or may not transfer. You need to check your your contract. Contract may control what transfers. The uh, South Carolina Realtors contract uh, says that fixtures convey, any personal property conveys if it's listed in the contract. Number 10 is the termite question. It's basically the same. There's been a lot of additions, mainly about what the bond, uh, con you know, the contents of the bond talk about. So let's go through that. So number 10, present infestation or damage which has not been repaired from past infestation, wood destroying insects or organisms, the task force added dry rot or fungus to those types of damage. And then the old question uh, said, is there a termite bond or warranty, yes or no? That's been the same since 03, but everything after that in question 10 is new, so let's go through that. The task force in 03 and the Real Estate Commission adopted and approved the name of the organization that treats the property for organisms. Um, and then it says, if there's a termite bond or warranty, please provide details, the expiration date, is it transferable, what's the amount that you'd have to pay to transfer it, what does the bond, uh, what does the bond uh, warrant or, or cover, and there's a blank for that. Is it a repair bond? Because some termite bonds, they go in there, they fix the damage, they treat it, others they just treat it, so it asks that. Um, is it a retreatment bond, or do they charge to come out and retreat? Um, is it a retreatment bond only? In other words, no repairs done or other, and you could explain that. And obviously, there's a. If you need more paper, you can obviously use the section at the end or attach another pa page to explain it, or you could even attach uh, the termite paperwork from the termite company. And then that box there at the bottom of page two of five, uh, it's got the property address and tax about number. That's in a. You know, our members requested that. Each page have the address, and then we've got the initials from the buyers and the sellers. And then number 11, this is on page 3 of 5, and those, the questions still refer back toward that, uh, that big box, you know, as seller of the property, do you have any knowledge of a problem, malfunction, or defect, or condition characteristic with any of the following? So number 11, the, um, the first line is the same as the 03 through 12, and then they've added a, B, C, and D. So let's go through that. Drainage, grading, or stability of soil or retaining, retaining structure. Yes, no, no representation. And then A, B, C, and D, recognizing that the seller is going to have the best access to knowledge about things that are, you know, underground, that aren't easy to see, that it's difficult for an inspector to find. So let's go through those. Um, A, are you aware of any underground tanks or voids? Probably the most common thing in some of the older houses, there's fuel oil tanks that were buried in the backyard and some used to have a vent a lot of times that vent is rusted off or been cut off so there might be you know landscaping covering it into the uh, average person looking they would have no idea that tank is there and if there's fuel in that tank it could be a contamination issue if you had a buyer that needed to go out there and you know wanted to put a pool in or something like that they would you know stumble into this there'd be added costs uh, to remove it so it's important for the seller to disclose all that B, are you aware of any soil drains on the property? This is uh, really, I think, what the task force was looking toward was kind of French drains, but recognizes, you know, some sellers might try to hem and haw and say, well, it's not really a French drain, so I didn't disclose it. Um, so the word soil drain was used there. That's any kind of, and it's really to detect some sort of drainage problem with the property, 
to get the seller to have to admit that there's an underground drain that's not really obvious to an inspector or a buyer walking around on the property and it would lead the buyer of course to ask some more questions hey if there's a drain the soil drain there why is it there what are some of the issues involved and um, so forth and so on see are you aware of any sump pumps on the property a lot of times if there's a you know some sort of flooding or water intrusion issue especially in a the basement there may be a, a sump pump um, but this is to let buyers be aware of some of those issues and D are you aware of significant fill material on or below the ground and this has been some callers that have called up asking about what is significant well keep in mind what this is really going for is to find out uh, you know a seller's in a good position to have known hey you know there was say there was a ravine and we put a bunch of organic material back there we covered it with dirt you know that stuff eventually is going to start to uh, decompose and it may create stability problems with the property or it may even impact the, uh, the foundation of the structure and really significant fill material you know if you had a seller that just brought in some bags of potting soil I think I don't think that's gonna be a lawsuit potential but if you had a seller that brought in a significant amount of organic material that's caused stability problems with the soil then that is uh, an issue that a lawsuit might generate but a seller could of course answer yes and say I brought you know three bags of potting soil if they wanted to but it's really going after those major issues when there's significant material that's not obvious to an inspector or a buyer and then the last question there if yes describe the tank voids or drains or pumps or material or amount you can describe you know I brought in a dump truck load of fill material uh, brought in sand gravel whatever you brought in so we could discuss that and then number 12 it talks about other built-in systems or fixtures that's a question that existed from 2003 through 2013 and then we've added some statements here mark below any systems that have malfunctions or defects and see your contract to see if these systems convey to the new owner because remember in the SCR contract fixtures convey uh, personal property does not convey unless it's part of the contract so these systems central vacuum and these are all the ones that are on the 03 through 12 version I'll point out the new additions here at the end central vacuum pool hot tub spa attic fan exhaust fan ceiling fan sump pump irrigation system cable TV wiring or satellite dish security systems here's the new ones a fountain storage building that's probably a common issue no sheds on the property water filtration systems solar panels and then in addition kind of a catch-all other for things that you know may come in in the future or something that's you know not on this list you could fill that in number 13 is probably the most important question we've added here North Carolina Real Estate Commission improved their seller disclosure they added common ownership issues South Carolina has actually gone beyond even North Carolina as they've added this repair question and this repair question was in response to years and years and years of members calling the Real Estate Commission calling the Realtor Association saying you know there was major foundation repair that was never disclosed my buyers upset you know other issues like that so a major repair question was added and the idea when the task force were working on this major repair question again if you had a seller that had been there for 50 years did not want sellers having to remember repairs you know dating back to the 60s so it's been limited in a scope of time and in a scope of question five hundred dollars so let's go through this question 13 this is the the major repair question this is a very big issue big addition that you need to make sure that your agents know about maybe they want to look at this uh, after when it's archived uh, maybe you want to have a sales meeting if you're a broker to emphasize this number 13 the repair question during your ownership or within the past five years if ownership exceeds five years had there been any individual repairs in excess of five hundred dollars to any item checked in questions one through twelve so you would go back through twelve which is the the drainage the built-in the foundation the roof water issues electrical plumbing HVAC water supply wastewater issues um, and then the kind of any kind of termite dry rot or fungus damage any of those issues the seller would answer a question and if there's a question you know I don't remember if this was five or six years I don't remember if the repair you know maybe I used my home warranty and so I'm not really sure the dollar amount you know if there's a question you can always answer yes and you can explain that and and disclose that way so if you know it's five hundred dollars or more if it was in your ownership within the last five years if your ownership exceeds five years you would answer yes you know if there's a seller has a question hey I don't remember if it was five or six years ago I don't remember the cost exactly 
Uh, the safest thing to do to protect the uh, seller, to give them that liability shield, you know, explain I did a repair, uh, explain what the repair was, um, and if they have any questions, refer them to their attorney. All right, so number 13, repair question, major change. Now we're getting into the second uh, box here, and you can see right under question 13, Mike's got it up. Regarding the property identified herein, including the lot, other improvements and fixtures located thereon, do you have any knowledge of any? 14 is a question that existed on the 2003 through 2012 form, and we've added one phrase uh, toward the end. So number 14 is room additions or other structural changes, and then the Real Estate Commission added made during your ownership. So I think that's important because you might have a buyer or, or seller rather that was a buyer and maybe the room addition or structural changes was made before they bought the property and may, they might not even realize that it was done to the property. So this, I think this is a good phrase to add. The Real Estate Commission said, are there any room additions or structural changes made during your ownership? So that's an addition. 15 is a question that existed from 2003 through 2012 and we've added some issues such as methamphetamines that have come up since then. This is the environmental hazard question. Substances, materials, or products including asbestos, formaldehyde, radon gas, methane gas, lead-based paint, underground storage tank, fuel oil, paint, PCBs, lead hazards, toxic mold, and then the uh, methamphetamine, methamphetamine byproducts, or other hazardous or toxic, toxic material, whether encapsulated, encapsulated is a new term added, along with that litany of buried or covered, any contaminated soil or water, or other environmental contamination they've added of the property. So some questions came up. One of the boards had some concerns about the word paint being there. I think because everything is painted, uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue about is there paint on the walls. I think that paint is referring to, you know, a seller knows that there's a bunch of buried paint or there's a bunch of paint that was spilled in the backyard and the soil's contaminated or there's a shed full of paint. Uh, ditto with fuel oil, whether that be in a storage tank or gas, gas cans buried underground or in a shed. And then the uh, methamphetamine issue, there's a methamphetamine clandestine uh, registry that DA, DEA, the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration operates. And that's similar to the state uh, sexual offender registry. This is something that buyers, if it's an issue, realtors should tell them if this is an issue for sex offenders or methamphetamine labor laboratories, you need to go to these websites and realtors should really refrain from going on those websites to avoid having actual knowledge of any any issues you know off-site conditions or on-site conditions and then the lead hazards this has been a, an increase uh, EPA has gone a few years ago EPA was in our in our jurisdiction in South Carolina inspecting the lead documents wanting buyer and sellers documents you know signed in each file and another issue that's come up lately is that EPA is emphasizing even beyond lead paint, so other lead hazards that may, may exist. And uh, we've gotten some calls on the hotline lately about sellers that like to bring in antique, you know, mantles or cornices or molding. Those may have lead paint on them, so make sure sellers are, are checking those uh, for, and buyers as well. Number 16 is kind of our off-site condition question. This existed from 2003 through 2013. Now there's an explanation blank added below, but it basically 16 asks nuisances, noise, odor, smoke, et cetera, effect, affecting the property. And that's a question that existed from 2003. Number 17, also a question that existed from 2003, and they've added um, smoke and water to this question. So 17 asks previous damage caused by fire. So previous damage caused by fire, that, that's the question that's been on the uh, seller disclosure from 03 through 2012, real estate commission has added or smoke or water damage. Number 18 is also a question that has existed uh, since 2003 through 2013. Real estate commission added restrictive covenants and other land use restrictions. So the old language was violations or variances of building codes or zoning ordinance that are applicable to property. Real estate commission added restrictive covenants other land use restrictions. So if the seller knows of a violation or a variance of the building code, restrictive covenants, other land use restrictions or zoning ordinances, they need to disclose those here. And sellers really going to be in the best position of anybody. They're the ones that have gotten that phone call, gotten that uh, lawyer uh, lawyer's letter to them, gotten that letter from the government about uh, a violation 
or had something posted on their property that you're in violation. So that's why that question is put on the sellers there from 2003 through 2013. Number 19, again, this is another question that's existed 03 through 2013. We've added some questions about our copies attached. So number 19, old language restricted to pro restrictions to property use, covenants or deed, and the Real Estate Commission added conditions. So restrictions to property use, uh, covenants, conditions, or deed. And most likely that answer is always going to be going to be yes because uh, you know there's good things about restrictions it helps uh, maintain property values it helps maintain the appearance of a neighborhood so restrictions well sometimes we hear about the negatives there's also positives for restrictions and then it says if yes or copies attached to so the seller you know if they had the bundle uh, from their past closing they may want to attach it or get their attorney to attach it uh, but this keys buyers to say hey um, I need to read these restrictions, covenants, conditions, and deed prior to signing this contract, making sure this property is appropriate for what I want to do. Um, you know, do I have an, a tractor trailer truck that I want to park in the front yard that may not be allowed? Do I want to uh, put a clothesline or fence in the front yard that may or may not be allowed? There may be um, architectural restrictions as well. And so it also says, new question, if there's a regime fee or similar fee, who do you pay? And then you, you explain that. And then that box is an addition with, you know, the members ask for property address on each page, and then the members, uh, buyers and sellers can initial and date. And the mic's got us set up uh, for number 20. And again, this is another question that's been in existence from 2003 through 2013. Utility or other easements, shared driveways, party walls, new language, erosion control, sea walls, riprap, et cetera, or in, and then the uh, remaining old language or encroachments from or on adjacent property. So utility or other easements, shared driveway, party walls, or encroachments from or on adjacent property. That was existing language. And then added to that was the erosion control. And that could be something that's on a river. It could be something that's on a lake. It could also be just somewhere in the neighborhood where there was erosion and they built some sort of erosion control uh, on the property. 21, again, another question existing from 2003 to 13 with a few ad added words, and we'll go through those. Uh, 21 lawsuits, foreclosures, bankruptcy, tenancies, judgments, tax, or other liens, proposed assessments, new language insurance issues, notice from any governmental agency, and then added individual or organization that could affect title to the property. So again, this recognizes the seller is going to be a, all the people in the world, closing attorney included, the seller is in the best position to know about any lawsuits, pending foreclosures, uh, bankruptcies, uh, tenancies, judgments, uh, tax liens, assessments, insurance issues, um, if there's any notice, say for a lawsuit or some sort of issue with the governments uh, from other individuals or other organizations that could affect property. Number 21, right under that, this, this question about volunteer information, this is really another, the task force and the Real Estate Commission you know, really struggled with off-site conditions because a lot of times the seller is going to be in the best position to know about something that's off-site that's difficult for an inspector or buyer or, or the real estate agents to detect. Um, so this blank is here. If you choose to volunteer information about nearby issues that may or may not be in the public record yet, please report here. And of course, is to volunteer, so the seller would, would choose that recognizing that if you disclose, you know, that major highway is going in the backyard or um, those wood, that wooded view that you've got um, is being converted to houses or a commercial use. Um, by putting that in here, it alleviates some of the chances of maybe some sort of frivolous lawsuit coming from a buyer in the future. So it does help uh, set up a liability shield. But again, if sellers have questions, your ethics require you uh, to refer them to their uh, attorney for those answers. Uh, 22 is a new, uh, new question. 22 says if there's a dock, dam, retaining wall, or other structure requiring inspections, permits, et cetera, have such requirements been complied with in full? And if, so, if the answer is yes, are the documents attached? So if uh, you needed a permit to add that extra room to the house, this question would cover that. If there's some sort of, uh, you know, at Lake Murray, SCNG puts a, a dock permit out there that has been complied with. Uh, dams are a big issue now where um, they're aging. Uh, they're a liability issue if they should crack in order to discharge and damage people downstream. And the same for some sort of retaining wall. Uh, there too. 23 is a new question in 2013. This is about recognizing that there's manufactured homes. Excuse me. 
and that the General Assembly has set up a way that you can retire that, that DMV. Uh, manufacturing home actually has a, basically like a car title, and there's a way to convert it into real property and retire that DMV title. So it asks, you know, has that been done? Are the documents attached? And um, we've even gotten some strange questions on the hotline where you had a manufactured home that was encapsulated by a site-built home that it may not even be obvious to the appraiser or the inspectors or the buyers or the real estate agents that there's a manufactured home built with a you know a structure built around it so this question would answer that and whenever there's a yes question buyer agents need to say hey buyer you know there's a yes answer we need to explore this fully may we ask more questions of the seller you know maybe we put these in writing give them to the listing agent to give them to the seller to get them answered maybe we need to make sure our inspectors focus on this issue <coughs> maybe we need to hire an inspection you know to critically focus on this issue if we see a yes answer 24 is a question that's been on the 2003 form through 2013 flood hazards are that the property is in a federally designated floodplain if there's flood insurance for the the new question is if there's flood insurance for the property what is the amount time period and coverage and thanks to the realtors that answered the call to action for NAR uh, we were able to finally get flood insurance set up for another five years instead of this every six months having to get a call to action and try to extend it so good job for uh, the realtors that answered that call to action and then the new question there please describe any erosion and erosion control measures 25 is a question that existed since 2003 uh, rental rental management vacation rental or other lease contracts in place on the property at the time of the closing this is really to make sure that um, if there is a tenant there then the parties have some things that they need to handle with their closing attorney they need to make sure that security deposit is handled correctly any kind of rents that need to be prorated are handled correctly if a buyer wants to keep the tenant and getting copies of the lease and the other documents getting those handled properly or say you've got a buyer that wants to move into the property they need to know if there's a tenant there so they can start working with the seller may the seller works with the tenant to buy out that lease and make sure that the buyer can move into the property if that's their desire but this question basically alerts people to that issue and then 26 a question that existed since 2003 <coughs> any outstanding charges owed for gas electric water sewage or garbage service provided to the property and then they've added that or delinquents I think that's probably a good phrase because every property is going to have you know quote unquote outstanding charges for gas electric water sewage and garbage service most likely and the old language had the word tenant in there so it struck tenant and just ask you know are there any overdue charges because buyer moves in you know and some of these services they basically use uh, the new service is, a, is an easy way to get collections from the old uh, past due fees so it's a good way for buyers to know make sure sellers pay their the amount that's due uh, otherwise the buyer would be forced you know to pay that amount maybe that would be the cheapest quickest way to get service there for them 27 through 40 this is uh, in response to years of questions asking for common ownership uh, questions North Carolina added common ownership questions to the property so 27 through 40 are all new questions and we'll go through those one by one um, owner association fees or common area expenses or assessments yes no no representation and note there's a category in a for not applicable so there's gonna be some properties that obviously some of these questions don't apply to real estate Commission allowed you to answer yes no no representation or not applicable are there any resale or rental restrictions we're hearing about through the hotline where owners associations might even have a write up for refusal on a property or they might say you can't rent it or there might be a maximum uh, percentage of rentals in that that development and that that uh, that amount may already have been reached so a buyer that's intending to buy this an investment and rent it they need to know about that so they can find out you know can they once they purchase it could they go ahead and rent it uh, 29 is the owners association involved in current or anticipated litigation um, there's been some questions about this that say hey most owners associations are always involved in current or anticipated litigation you know if they got delinquent uh, fees coming in so you might want to answer yes to these but probably this is really looking at when's a buyer going to file a lawsuit about this the buyer would buy the property and find out you know HOA is involved in some big lawsuit all the owners are going to get assessed for legal fees and so the sellers in best position to know about those issues 
uh, and disclose those here. Number 30 is owner's association level levied special or insurance assessments. And again, a lot of these owner's associations, we're getting reports um, where some of the areas where owners aren't paying their fees or owners have gone into foreclosure and they're not collecting these fees. Um, this is a way to disclose as the owner's association level uh, special or insurance assessments. Again, the seller's gonna be in the best position to know about those and disclose those. And again, to keep the <coughs> buyer from getting in there and finding out post-closing, hey, I've got this thousands of dollars that I've got to pay to the uh, owner's association. 31 guest visitor animal restriction. The animal restriction was asked for by the Columbia Board. Um, but this is really for those buyers that maybe want to know about their guests, visitors, you know, can they raise chickens in the backyard? Can they have large dogs? Can they have numerous pets? Can they have exotic animals? So the, some owner's associations restrict those and the question came up you know, some governments limit some of the, uh, the types of animals that can be uh, kept in city limits, so that might be an issue there. 32, does the property include an assigned parking space? Um, you know, obviously some properties have those. 33, are keys required to access common or recreational areas? Again, you know, you've got a, a pool area, a gymnasium, you know, you might have a key that are required to access. And then two questions about are copies of things attached. Is a copy of the master deed and bylaws attached? The seller could attach those if they had them or say, no, they're not attached. And that would key the buyer, hey, maybe I need to read the master deed and bylaws for this property before I sign the contract, make sure this property meets my needs. And 35, similar, similar question, is a copy of the covenant conditions and restrictions attached? <coughs> seller could attach those if they wanted to or say no. But again, it's gonna key buyer and buyer agents to know, hey, Covenants, conditions, restrictions, maybe I need to read those prior to signing contract, make the proper, make sure the property meets my needs. 36, is there a transfer fee levy to transfer the property? And there's been some questions if that includes deed stamps. I guess if uh, you know, a seller felt inclined, they would check that. That's in the contract. Most buyers aren't gonna sue about that. They're gonna know there's $3.70 per thousand to record, and it's usually a seller fee uh, in the SCR contract anyway. But, this is really to pick up some of those uh, grandfathered, you know, private transfer fees, for example. In some areas, those private transfer fees are $20,000. So it's important for the buyer to know about those fees prior to getting in involved with that property. And then 37, what are the ownership association dues? The dollar amount per the time period. 38, what do these dues cover? Is insurance included? And what is the name and contact information for the owner's association? Fill in the blank. 40, will any memberships transfer with the property? Yes or no, documentation attached. I'm a classic example of that. A lot of times golf memberships, say in a community, would transfer and there's an explanation space below that. And then we've added the uh, property address and tax map number. And again, zip forms would auto load that. And then the classic initials and dates for the buyer and seller. And we're getting on to the last page. Mike's already got that good job, Mike. Uh, it talks about here's the space where you need extra space. You can obviously attach pages if you need to. If you answered yes, and I'm reading from the box at the top, if you answered yes to any of the previous questions, please use the following space for explanation and attach any relevant professional reports and additional information. And then because that's such an important section, there's actually space for the address and the buyer and the seller initial. And then if you're interested in reading the statute, um, it says how to get to it. You can go to the, uh, the South Carolina Code 2750 and 10 and et cetera, et sequitur is a Latin, basically meaning the other sections following that. And it actually gives you the state website where you can read all the South Carolina codes, uh, you know, the statehouse.gov. And the uh, kind of the relevant sections for real estate agents are basically two main sections beside the exemptions, but. Uh, we talked about 20-50-65. That was the one that said if the owner doesn't give a form and he's required to or he gives false, incomplete, or misleading information, buyer can sue for actual damages and court costs plus attorney's fees. That's important. And the next section for our real estate agents, for our members, our realtors, uh, section 27-50-70, this talks about the duty of the listing agent to notify the owner of the disclosure obligations because most sellers may not even know about this law. So it talks about a listing agent or any real estate licensee operating for any party in a residential real estate transaction must inform in writing each owner covered by the listing agreement 
of the owner's obligation prescribed in this article. If the listing agent performs this duty, he is not liable to the owner's refusal or failure to provide a prospective purchaser with a disclosure statement. And then it talks about B, this article does not conflict with or alter the duties of a real estate licensee pursuant to the regulations of this commission. The real estate licensee, whether acting as the listing agent or selling agent, is not liable to a purchaser. And so this is your liability shield that that case, uh, Hilt Bibble uh, versus Chastain covered. So you're not liable to the purchaser if one, the owner provides the purchaser with a disclosure form that contains false, incomplete, misleading information. And remember that court case said the real estate commit the real estate licensee did not know uh, or have reasonable cause to suspect that the information was false, incomplete, or misleading. So based on that language in that court case, that's why the hotline, why we recommend that uh, realtors handle this form with kid gloves, keep it at kind of a 10 foot pole level, uh, inform the seller they need to fill it out, seller here's the form, any questions go to your attorney. Because I think based on that court language, if you've got testimony from a seller that said, you know, you're, you know, when the question's, hey, did this uh, realtor help you fill out this form? And the seller says, yeah, they, you know, we sat down, we went through every question. I asked them, you know, how did I fill this out? They, you know, they checked the box for me. All of a sudden, that makes it a lot easier for a buyer's lawyer to say, your honor, the statute liability shield no longer is in effect because obviously we have testimony that the seller, that the realtor helped them fill it out. So the real estate license did know or did have reasonable cause to suspect the information was false, incomplete, or misleading. And then underlined under that where it talks about sestatehouse.gov, it says this disclosure does not limit the obligation of the purchaser to inspect. So buyers should not rely just on this form. It's a good tool, but remember buyer agents need to recommend buyers get all those inspections, home inspections. Um, if they want to hire air experts or mold experts, termite people, surveyors, appraisers, structural engineers, get those people out there. To inspect the physical condition of the property and improvements that are the subject of the sales agreement. The real estate licensee, whether acting as listing agent or selling agent, has no duty to inspect on-site or off-site conditions of the property and any improvements. And then the owner acknowledgement. This is pretty similar to what we've got now. You've got the property address. The property is currently owner-occupied or leased or in an estate. In foreclosure, I think in foreclosure, you know, pre-foreclosure includes short sales. So this may be an issue that the seller needs to check with their attorney. Maybe they need to disclose if they're in some sort of short sale or foreclosure scenario. If it's vacant, how long has it been vacant? Owner's name, and then owners acknowledge having examined the statement before signing that all information is true and correct as of the date signed. And if something changes, you know, there's no roof leak now, but the seller fills this out, then the roof starts leaking. <coughs> Excuse me. The seller has a duty to update this form. So make sure the sellers are aware of that. If something were to change, tree falls on the house, the roof leaks, all of a sudden they notice a crack in the foundation. You know, any number of these issues where they've answered no, and all of a sudden the answer maybe is yes, the seller needs to update this form to protect themselves. Owner signs dates and time, and then the purchaser acknowledges receiving it. And again, in our standard forms, this is reiterated in our contract, but the purchaser acknowledges receipt of the copy of this disclosure statement that he or she has examined it before signing that he or she buyer understands it's not a warranty by the owner or the owner's agent and it is not a substitute for any inspection. So buyer, buyer agents need to tell their buyers you need to get inspections. Um, buyer may wish to obtain these inspections and that the representations are made by the owner and not the owner's agent or sub-agent. So realtors need to emphasize this thing is coming from the seller. We didn't fill it out as realtors. We're not involved in it. If there's any issues, you need to talk to your attorney about actions against the seller. A uh, purchaser is encouraged to obtain his or her own inspection by a licensed home inspector or other professional. Purchaser signs, dates, and times it. And again, at the bottom, zip forms would auto fill this, but tax map, property address, initial buyers and sellers. Um, so that's gone through the uh, 2013 form. That form goes into effect January 1st, 2013. So if you take a listing, uh, January 1st, going forward, 2013, 2014, the seller would use the new form if you have an existing listing in 2012, you've already got the 2012 seller disclosure. Real Estate Commission met yesterday and voted that that is retroactive. Those sellers can use that 2012 form. You do not need to update that seller disclosure going into 2013. So I know a lot of our members were worried. You know, we've got 40,000 plus listings out there. Sellers were on Christmas 
vacation. It's difficult to track them down. Real Estate Commission recognized that difficulty and said, look, sellers that have filled out this form in 2012, that form is good through the entire uh, time of that listing. If the listing were to expire and then pick up again, obviously it'd use the 2013 form. And any listings where you take a listing agreement 20, January 1st, 2013 and forward, you use the new form. Mike, we have any questions? Yeah, we have a bunch of them. So um, we'll start with at the beginning. If the property address and TMS is essential for a separate period of pages, why is it not needed on all state contracts? Um, this is the, uh, you know, kind of outside the scope of what we're doing, but this was the members that said, hey, we've got a question about um, this particular issue. We want it on each each property, um, but the Forms Committee, they obviously control our forms. We'll have to we'll have to bring that up with the Forms Committee if that's an issue. But we've not gotten any calls about uh, the state contract, about there not being an address on page two or three, so, but um, the Forms Committee, I'll take that to the Forms Committee. Um, when will this be available on Zip Forms? Zip Forms has the uh, updated seller disclosure from uh, LLR, and what they do is obviously they have to load it, and their computer techs have to get it ready to go into their system and be form fillable. And because the form takes effect January 1st, January 1st, Zip Forms has promised that it'll go live on January 1st. Um, why is only the roof question number two limited to the past three years? Does this mean all other questions go back through the entire home ownership? example last 50 years yeah the question is uh, question two is roof leaks and gutters it says are there any problems so approximate age of roof covering and it says are you aware of any leaks during your ownership or within the past three years if your ownership exceeds three years so um, B if you're aware of any leaks during your ownership if you had a long and again the I think the task force if you had a somebody that owned it 50 years they didn't want them having to remember a, a roof leak in 1963 so they basically have said uh, any roof leaks during your ownership or within the past three years. And then remember question 13, ask about uh, repairs. So if there was a roof leak that was repaired, that goes back five years if the repair costs more than $500. Okay, um, number 10, uh, the expiration date, uh, the bond expires each year. The annual fees are not paid even on five-year bond. It expires annually without the renewal. Which date are they asking about? Let's see, it says, is there a termite bond or warranty? Please provide, describe the expiration date. Um, something like that, if the seller hasn't paid, if it's a five-year bond and the seller hasn't paid it and it's already expired, they probably need to disclose that. So, but again, that would be a good question. Say, hey, seller, that's outside my scope as a real estate agent. Um, you need to ask that question of your attorney. And because that termite issue is such an expensive and high risk for lawsuit, I think that's an important question that, uh, you know, because of the amount of damages that could show up, a buyer would be likely to file a lawsuit. So a real estate agent would want to make very sure on some sort of structural or termite issue. Um, those are definitely issues you need to tell the seller to talk to their attorney. Um, on 11B, um, where it says, are you aware of any soil drains on the property? Uh, one person wanted to know if, shouldn't it be underground solid drains? Yeah, and like I said, the, I think the task force really wrestled with this because uh, uh, it's difficult to word a question without being able, the seller to be able to, you know, basically hem and haw about it because I think that the classic one we all think about is French drains. That was the originally some of the language that there was, was in the original is what I remember the task force. And they were worried that we we're going to have sellers that were going to hem and haw and say, well, it's not a quote unquote French drain. So the idea was uh, this, this soil drain and obviously, um, you know, if it's on the surface, it's going to be obvious. So when would a lawsuit come out? You know, you've got some sort of underground drain that's not, not visible to the people and it was never disclosed. So, um, but I made a note of that underground solid drain. Okay, on number 12, uh, could you... Oh, he, he was just asking if you could get the check boxes lined up with each other. Yeah, and this is a living document. So the Real Estate Commission, uh, we've gotten, you know, obviously uh, questions saying, hey, the Real Estate Commission needs to make the layout better. Um, and that'll be something they'll work on going forward. But keep in mind, you know, from 2003 to 2008, um, you know, from 2008 is when the first task force met. That was the LLR and the and the and SCR along with the realtors, you know, Peggy Ganey, Janine Keys, and Andy Walker. So this is basically a, almost a five-year project we've been working on. So I think now that we've gotten a, a big change on it, 
the real estate commission is more open to looking at this form so maybe it'd be something they update annually and obviously layout would be something they could they could work on uh, number 16 uh, for odor would that include smokers in the home um, nuisances um, you know conceivably yes um, but the nuisance what what you're talking about there is what's going to really be like a lawsuit and I guess it could you know it talks about uh, you know nuisance includes smoke so if you had a, a buyer that was uh, you know allergic to cigarette smoke and it wasn't disclosed and they got in there and they had some sort of respiratory reaction um, you know that's conceivable that they would hire a lawyer and maybe sue so that may be something that the seller you know checks yes and says you know sellers and guests smoked in property and that I think that's going to be a big issue going forward even in tenancy issues where we've gotten calls where there are trial lawyers now that are going after this issue but again uh, that's a good question uh, to say hey uh, seller uh, you know I'm a real estate agent I'm not trained in this issue that's a good question for your um, attorney uh, number 23 if there's no manufactured home do you need to check no or no res uh, representation um, if the property includes a manufactured home, has it been legally converted to real property? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Probably, uh, I'd say it's you know there's no manufactured home on the property. You know, no representation. There is no non-applicable box. I'll make a note of that. But probably, you know, yes and no aren't really appropriate. So the only other choice would be no representation. So that would probably be an appropriate answer. Um. Uh, another person said, last I heard from our broker in charge with SCR assistance uh, was to not use uh, not applicable anywhere on our contracts. Why does this new section have a fourth non applicable column? Yeah, the question is about the common ownership questions 27 through 40. Uh, that's recognizing that, uh, you know, there are a lot of properties in South Carolina that, that don't have uh, common ownership issues, so that non applicable was, was added mainly because this section is really designed for common ownership questions um, and so that fourth one was added there because there may be some of these questions that, that don't apply like that that DMV question we just had about manufactured home that may be an appropriate space for the real estate commission to add non-applicable someday so that's why that's there. Um, another person following along those same lines uh, is section 27 through 40 only for condos and townhouses. It could be uh, the questions uh, 27 through 40 uh, is that for condominiums or townhouses it could be but Keep in mind, there's also residential neighborhoods that have common, you know, I know a lot of neighborhoods have a pool or a clubhouse. Um, maybe they uh, collect money from all the owners for uh, the signage at the front or the lighting or maybe even to upkeep the uh, streets. So it, it may be applicable to some of those. And I think really maybe, you know, the Real Estate Commission could have left no representation, but if we didn't have non-applicable you know, we'd get a flood of questions. Why is it, you know, what do I do? It's not applicable. So I think that was to try to offset some of those questions coming in. So the answer is it applies to anything with a common ownership. That could be a, a single family, you know, a duplex. It could be a high rise condominium at the beach. Uh, it could be, uh, it could be your typical house in the suburbs. Um, on the, the last page, uh, five has property address and initials slash signature in three separate places all on the same page isn't that a bit much yeah and like i said the uh the real estate commission uh this is a living document so they'll uh obviously look at some of the layout issues um and it's those two boxes have the signature and date the last one you know maybe ideally you could leave off the initials there at the bottom but it didn't have the property address and uh, i think under the explanation 